Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome uh, to this celebration of the Geert Hofstede Chair, which is going to be uh, particularly celebrated with the inauguration of Mark Peterson later on this afternoon. But we're very happy to first give you a overview of some of the very typical approaches towards culture from uh, Universiteit Maastricht. And we do this by um, having invited some of the uh, outstanding faculty in the different areas of the different faculties and schools to give their views on the subject of culture. You'll see that culture as such is a typical container concept. You can use it in different ways. It different, there's different kinds of content. content. Um, but this will most probably also uh, challenge you to give your views after the presentations that uh, will soon start. There are two parts this afternoon. First is this hopefully uh, representative overview of some of the views on, uh, on culture uh, from uh, typical uh, UM scholars. Um, the procedure is that we would like to have some interaction with you if you feel that you've got a point to score, do so. Um, later on, um, we will have a break and then we go for the uh, inaugural address with an introduction of uh, the University President Joe Ritsen and, of course, an introduction of Geert Hofstede himself. I would, uh, for that reason, I would like to welcome Geert Hofstede and Mark Peterson uh, uh, in particular, and hopefully you will uh, enjoy this, uh, the first part, as much as we, um, I'm pretty sure, as we will do. Um, we will have six presentations. Um, we thought it would be nice after three presentations and discussions with the floor that uh, we'd have a musical break. So we've invited Volodomir, I can't pronounce his last name, but I'll practice in the meantime, um, so before him arriving that I can actually welcome him properly. But Volodymyr will um, give a musical um, intermezzo in between after the third speaker. And we will then proceed with uh, three other presentations and um, break again around three. As I said, we will roughly have per presentation uh, 20 minutes. 10 to 12 minutes uh, will be for um, the scholar to uh, present her or his views on uh, eight particular uh, subjects related to culture. And I will then invite you to uh, uh, give your views or have questions uh, and we will break anyway uh, each time after 20 minutes and to continue with the second, third, and so forth speaker. It's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce and, and announce uh, Shaq Kunis, who represents the Faculty of Arts and Culture. And uh, he's been uh, doing quite a bit of research uh, from a political philosophical uh, approach on, uh, on the subject of culture. And uh, I, I guess that uh, Shaq's introduction will appeal quite a bit. Shaq, floor is to you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, the title of my presentation is The Overvaluation of Culture. I just move this away a bit, okay. To claim that nowadays culture is being overvalued, overrated, might come as a surprise from someone like me who works in the Faculty of Arts and Culture. Culture is my daily bread. So let me start by qualifying this title. In general, one can distinguish three meanings of the concept of culture. First, culture refers to a general process of intellectual, spiritual, and aesthetical development. Culture does, in this first meaning, is civilization. Well, we cannot have enough civilization, that's for sure. So my title doesn't refer to this meaning, even though these days there is a lot of strife about what civilization actually amounts to. Is Western civilization the best of all possible worlds? To phrase, paraphrase the philosopher Leibniz. Or should we look in the mirror a bit more critically? Culture can also refer to the products of intellectual and artistic activities, 
I think of the philosophy of Plato, the plays of Shakespeare, the novels of Louis Couperus. This you might call monumental culture because these products are the monuments around which we celebrate our cultural canon or tradition. Of culture in this second meaning, we also cannot have enough. Although the canon of high culture is not as solid as it used to be either. High culture used to be the binding ideal to which the working class and other social outsiders had to be educated. In fact, I think it's the low culture of pop music, McDonald's, MTV, and the cinema industry, which, whether we like it or not, is responsible for most of the cohesion in our globalizing world. But this confusing paradox is not what my title refers to either. My title refers to a third meaning of culture, culture as a way of life, of a nation, an ethnic group, uh, the way of life of an organization. For instance, the national culture of the Dutch, the regional culture of the Limburgers, the company culture of the University of Maastricht. I want to make some comments about this notion of culture. It is also this interpretation of culture which is central to the work of Professor uh, Hofstede. As you all know, or should know, Hofstede defines culture as the software of the mind. Maybe not the minds of individuals, but culture is programmed in the collective mind of nations. If you know the culture of a group, their values, their symbols, their rituals, then you can predict their behavior. It's an understatement to say that Hofstede has developed an impressive and fertile research program. I think that's why we're here together. His indexes of power distance, masculinity and for femininity, avoidance of uncertainty, etc., are famous all over the world, also among anthropologists, by the way. His intellectual project reminds me of that of the sociologist Emile Durkheim, who said about social groups similar things as Hofstede said about national cultures. They are things in themselves. And this sounds more interesting if you say it in German, Dinge an sich, things in themselves which have their own essence. Catholics, explained Durkheim in his famous monograph about suicide, Catholics commit suicide less frequent than Protestants, not because of the psychology of, of Catholics, but because of the nature of Catholic communities. In a similar vein, the Dutch are more feminine than the Germans. So we have to fear for the worst again in the upcoming World uh, Championship football. <laughs> anyway, it is, I think, in this inspiration that Hofstede has tried to make culture solid, measurable, and also open to practical intervention, which is also important. Now, the comments I want to make about culture in this third meaning of way of life are inspired by my own discipline. This is the political philosophy. The claim that culture is important does not fit comfortably in the self-interpretation of modernity, which was heavily influenced by the Enlightenment. In this self-image of modern modernity, modern rational individuals tend to look at themselves as beyond the bounds of tradition and culture and ideology. Modern politics is perceived as rational discourse and interaction between individuals. Okay, they may be members of particular communities, but their group identity never becomes the single most important factor. Classical liberalism and Marxism have been the most important heirs of this modernity. They thought that it was in the best interest of people to give up the remnants of their culture or that they would lose their culture anyway under the impact of the forces of modernity. This self-interpretation of modernity has difficulties with phenomena like patriotism, chauvinism, religious fundamentalism, and other, to use a phrase of Benjamin Barber, jihad-like reactions from specific communities. 
it also has problems with the understanding of religion. According to Mark Jugendmeier, in, in a recent uh, Nexus lecture, religion has risen from modernity like a phoenix. In underlining the importance of culture, Hofstede works, Hofstede's work resonates with the work of philosophers like Charles Taylor and Will Kim Lika. They too strive, they too stress the importance of taking account of even recognizing the cultural identities of people who find themselves in pluriform political communities. And also with the sociological work of Amitai Ezioni, who has become one of the leading ideologists of American communitarianism, uh, which is a, a philosophy about the importance of community. And uh, this uh, Ezioni happens to be also a sort of special advisor of our Prime Minister, Jan Peter Balkenende. And of course, with that of Samuel Huntington, who coined the phrase, the clash of civilizations. As a political scientist, he has always been critical of the shallow faith in progress of the so-called modern sociologists who also projected the progressive root of Western society on non-Western societies. So, it is safe to say that culture is important. Those politicians who forget this important lesson and try to repress culture, learn it the hard way why culture is important. Take, for instance, what happened uh, with the stranded European constitution. As soon as citizens have the feeling that Europe is projected as some kind of modernizing train which European nations have to jump on, the importance of national culture is reaffirmed again. But there's also a catch here. Politics, and let me define this as the ensemble of activities and institutions which make it possible for people from different cultural religious backgrounds to live together, this politics, I think, only works if people are willing to let go some of their culture without having the feeling that they have to let go of all of their culture. So whereas modernists underestimate the importance of culture, their critics make the mistake of overvaluing culture. They don't realize that people who want to live together peacefully will have to let go of parts of their culture or ways of living. And usually these are the parts they find most important. I was just talking about monumental culture in the context of the arts, but you could also use this idea of monumental culture to refer to those aspects of culture which people find most important, vital or even holy. Religious people, for instance, don't like to live in a mostly secularized world in which religion is a private affair. That the society they live in does not accept their religion as holy or monumental is something that bothers them. And the same holds for other values and rituals which define the core of cultural traditions. And it is here that I would like to take issue with the work of Professor Hofstede, because in his theory, people are primarily culture dopes. Politics cannot and should not be used as a means to express culture, be it the cultural identity of a particular group within society, or even of the cultural identity of a nation as a whole. It is this expressive interpretation of politics which, which has produced multiculturalism as a normative ideal, that is, the notion that it is possible to fully recognize the cultural identities of different cultural groups in one society. And it has also produced the current backlash against multiculturalism, the belief in monoculturalism, which also suffers from the over-evaluation of overvaluation of culture. If the history of politics and also the history of political philosophy in which the history of politics is reflected has learned one lesson, then it is this. Politics is the art of taking culture seriously, but not too seriously. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a, a wonderful illustration of being uh, of, of perfect timing. I would say uh, uh, it's up to you. It's uh, those in the audience who would like to uh, take the way he presented culture and his views on culture seriously, but not too seriously. Whether you would like to react on uh, 
on his position. Whom can I invite to... Uh, you've got the spotlight. Who would like to comment? Please go ahead. There, there, are, there are supposed to be microphones, and let me see whether that's properly arranged. There were microphones, and otherwise I... a need for maybe identity, to build up the identity. <coughs> and especially in the Netherlands, we have a bad reputation on, I think, on the relationship between the government uh, and normally, you know, our uh, identity. I mean, the government, for instance, also, and industries. How can we reinforce, according to your thesis, this uh, identity development of the Dutch? Because in this sense, I would say that your thesis is not true, that we really need also that politics would uh, reinforce the identity. Is my question clear? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think if you say that, that uh, microphone is on, if you say that identity is important, I would agree with you, but you have to realize if you talk about identities of, let's say, complex groups like the Dutch, then you have to be aware that this identity is a mixed one. It's a very, uh, even to a certain extent, a muddled one. Eh? There is a lot of different identities actually sort of combined in this one identity. And that's why I think if you talk about identity being important, I rather talk about political identity. So ways of, let's say, also making a clear stand towards other people, obviously, but also making clear that what we stand for is not just one particular culture. It's sort of a civilization which combines, which has tolerance, which has ways to organize and to also sometimes uh, mellow out sort of cultural holy things, because that's where the itch comes. I mean, if, if people try to let's say, uh, fight for what they find holy, they usually find themselves out of the country or other groups. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Who else? The gentleman over there. Go, go. Maybe you can throw it. Well, thank you very much for making this a self-service facility. Good, thank you. Uh, do you hear me? No. Does it work? Yeah, it works. Uh, your thesis was that uh, for integration you, or for living together uh, in a multicultural environment, you have to let go some of your culture. Uh, how do you relate that to recent research which was published, published in the NRC uh, a couple of months ago about uh, second and third generation immigrants uh, which uh, showed that those integrate best who uh, are, are uh, close to their parents' culture as well close to their cu the culture they are living in. They, they, the, the research make distinction between four quadrants. You can, be, you can lose out your, your, your ethic, uh, ethnic culture, your parents' culture. You can be far away from the culture you're living in, or you can be close to what either of yeah. them. You, you, you know what I'm referring to? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, now, I think you, you gave at least part of the answer already, because th those people that are most successful have at least a, a sort of a bifocal orientation. They know and are aware of, and they also, I think, have respect for their own culture, so they don't have the feeling that they have to be ashamed for where they come from, obviously. 
Uh, I mean, it's the same with, let's say, Moroccans as it used to be with the Dutch uh, Catholics, for instance. Whereas at the same time, they also have a focus on society in general. So they are able to sort of connect what happened in their own culture with, let's say, a more general uh, uh, culture of the Dutch, uh, the education system, etc., how we deal with religion, etc. So you have to have this bifocal uh, uh, yeah, sort of orientation, and that implies already letting go one, at least some of your culture. You cannot just live in one culture anymore. An interesting standpoint, because I would say it's the opposite. It's embracing both cultures rather than letting go aspects of one. But that's maybe a, 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 yeah. a different angle to yeah. the issue. Living in one culture means that that's your only point of reference. Uh, uh, and that is not possible in a pluriform society. Uh, so you have to have more points of reference and at least accept that other people might have a different culture. I, mean, I think we are, as, apart from the semantics, we are on one uh, opinion here. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to comment or raise another point? Any one of the other faculty here present? Uh, There's someone uh, over there. Excuse me, excuse me. Uh, the lady over there in, in the back row. Thank you. Um, as a Canadian of mixed ancestry, living here, uh, well, living in Germany, um, I, I think that um, how you identify yourself uh, if you come from a mixed background has a lot to do with um, uh, the country that you live in and what kind of freedoms they give you uh, to be who you are, to be part of that, of that particular culture. Like in Canada, you, um, the government, the, the, the culture itself, accepts you as Canadian if you're born and you're raised there. There's, there's no discussion really in that. So you are Canadian and you, um, no matter what your hereditary um, background is, you grow up with the psychological freedom that you are of that identity. And no one questions that. And the issue of race or religious background really doesn't come into question at, at all. But um, living in Germany, um, the, the issue of race is always a question and is always raised. And um, I just know that people of different racial backgrounds, uh, cultural backgrounds living in Germany, um, there is that, that concept, the German concept of identity, which has a lot to do with blood, your bloodline. And that automatically links to racial background. So if you don't happen to be that particular race, all right, then the, the, the assumption is that you um, are not really German. You see what I'm saying? So the people, let's say if you're Asian or you're black and you're growing up in German society, you could be born and raised there, but you're never um, completely recognized as being German. So I think there's that, um, when you talk about you know, giving up something, sometimes um, people don't even let you give up certain things. People don't allow you to make that step and just identify yourself as being either German or Dutch or, or, or what, you know. And I think that uh, um, one of those advantages of living in a, um, a, a really diverse multicultural country uh, in, in a government that sees itself as being a mosaic. I think the people, the second generation who are born and raised there, they have that psychological freedom to do exactly uh, what, what you're, you're describing. Thank you very much, Jacques. Uh, I was waiting for the question, but uh, <laughs> uh, I think you, uh, what you're trying to say is that you, uh, for the most part, agree with me. I would be careful with talking about in terms of citizenship, about bloodline and, uh, and that, because that's a mid, bit more complicated also in Germany, and it doesn't explain uh, itself why there is a, at least a certain amount of racism in Germany, which is uh, also to be found here. I, I'm, I wouldn't make that connection so tight as you do it, but for the rest I can, uh, I can fully agree with your comments, yeah. Okay, we, we conclude with the, uh, this, this first part, uh, and, and I I would like to commend myself that the, the only legitimate Reinheit idea in Germany would be the Reinheitsgebot for German beer, uh, because that, that, that's really a good 
top quality product. Uh, <laughs> my suggestion is that we move on to uh, Peter van den Bosse, who, uh, as a professor of international economic law, um, has been uh, quite a bit involved with the World Trade Organization uh, and with its policies and policy development in that context. So he will um, discuss with us and give a short presentation on free trade and cultural diversity. Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, my presentation this afternoon, my talk, is about Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. It is also about Knielen op een bed violen by Jan Sibeling, of which, and I suppose that's typical, I do not have a copy. This talk is about Harry Potter, number four, the movie. And it is about Lamelio Gioventù. And I do hope that you know this six hour long movie because it is the best movie I have seen since Cinema Paradiso. Back to Dan Brown. Dan Brown has in 2005 in the Netherlands sold 310,000 copies. Of all his books together, he sold in 2005 almost one million copies, just in the Netherlands. Needless to say that no Dutch author, not even Jan Sibling, comes close to such sales figures. In the list of the best 100 selling books in the Netherlands, in 2005, there are only 10, 10 books that were originally written in Dutch. In 2005, about 320 new movies were released in the Netherlands, 320. 130 of them were European movies. But these movies, these European movies, had a market share of only 22%, while American movies had a market share of 76%. In the top 10 of most popular movies of last year, there is not a single Dutch or European production. I will spare you the numbers on other products of popular culture. They're not very different. For quite some years, many cultures have had to cope with the through onslaught of cultural products, cultural goods, cultural services of American origin. In the view of the cultural sector in many countries, their culture and cultural diversity is under siege. And they cry out for protection. In response to this call for protection, many governments have reacted and have adopted measures to support domestic cultural goods and services. Now, then of course immediately France and Canada come to mind as being particularly active in protecting their own cultural products and services, but also the Dutch government has taken measures to promote Dutch slash European goods and services of a cultural nature. The measures that governments have taken 
to promote national culture and cultural diversity take many different forms. They include, of course, direct subsidies and import restrictions. But they also include tax rebates, screen quotas, price fixing, limits on foreign investment and ownership, nationality requirements, domestic content requirements, and so much more. Without these measures, the situation in many, the situation of many national cultures would probably be even worse than currently is the case. However, and that's really where my story as a lawyer starts. One often hears the argument that these and other measures to protect and promote national culture may be inconsistent with obligations of international trade law, and in particular, the law of the World Trade Organization. The most relevant rules, WTO rules in this respect, are first of all, the prohibitions of discrimination. And in particular, the most favored nation obligation which, and I promise you, I will not give you a, a lecture in international trade law, but just by way of example, most favored nation treatment obligation requires, for example, the European communities to give books imported from the United States similar treatment to books imported from Canada. If it does anything else, it would violate the most favored nation treatment obligation. Second prohibition of discrimination relates to the national treatment obligation. What is that? That's the obligation of, for example, the European communities to treat foreign books, once they're imported, to treat these foreign books no less favorable than it treats its own books, its domestic books. Other important WTO rules. Well, obviously, the prohibition of quantitative restrictions, quotas, and the rules on subsidies. Now, these are merely the most relevant WTO rules. There are, I can assure you, many others that are of some relevance. But in the light of this possible conflict, or this perceived conflict, what is it that governments can or should do? It seems to me that one can identify four different approaches, four approaches that governments could take. First of all, that's my first approach. First approach is to take culture, to take trade in cultural goods and cultural services out of the WTO. This was very much the approach adopted by France and Canada in the late 80s and early 90s when the WTO agreement, General Agreement on Trade in Services, the GATS, was negotiated. They did not want, they, France and Canada, did not want WTO law to apply on cultural goods at all. They did not want WTO law to apply on cultural services at all. France and Canada were, however, unable to convince the rest of the world of the merits of this approach. And I think it's unlikely that much has changed or will change in this respect. Second approach. The second approach is to do nothing. That is, just to apply current WTO rules 
on trade in cult cultural goods and services, as if they were normal goods and services. At present, that is in fact what is happening. And at present, this is, to some extent at least, still an acceptable option. And to understand why, at present, this is still an acceptable option, it is important to know that with regard to trade in services, and the emphasis is on trade in services, this is not true for trade in goods, but for trade in services, the obligation of national treatment and the obligation not to adopt quantitative restrictions, that that obligation only applies if WTO members, if a WTO member has specifically committed itself to national treatment and to the non-adoption of quantitative restrictions in a particular sector of services, in a particular service sector. Now, with regard to culture, cultural services, the European Union and its member states and most WTO members have not thus far taken such commitments. And that means, in practice, that, at least under WTO law, the Dutch government may still subsidize the production of Dutch movies. It also means that it is still possible for France and the European Union, and they do both that, to impose restrictions on the number of American movies shown on television. However, I think that the cultural sector is correct to fear that over time, and I emphasize over time, the European Union and its member states will gradually make more and more commitments with respect to cultural services. And then, when that happens, as a result, of course, of further trade negotiations, when they make more commitments with regard to national treatment, with regard to the prohibition of quantitative restrictions, when they make more commitments, then the current rules may, long, may no longer allow measures to protect national cultural and cultural diversity as we have them now. Third approach. The third approach is to create a parallel set of international rules next to the WTO rules. Parallel, a set of parallel rules that would allow countries to take measures for the protection of cultural diversity. That is exactly what the UNESCO did in 2005 when adopting the Convention on the Protection of Cultural Diversity. Such a parallel set of rules, next to the WTO rules, raises of course the question how those two sets of rules relate Which rules prevail when there's a conflict? Well, there's no clear answer to that question. Moreover, the United States has refused to become a party to this UNESCO Convention on the Protection of Cultural Diversity. Fourth and final approach, and that is the approach I would like to promote, is to include in WTO law itself appropriate cultural exceptions. Cultural exceptions that would permit countries to set aside WTO rules, to allow them under conditions to take trade restrictive measures intended to protect cultural diversity. WTO law provides for 
many of these exceptions. It provides, for example, for exceptions for the protection of public health or for the protection of the environment. WTO law currently lacks effective exceptions for the protection of cultural diversity. I would like to plead for the inclusion of such effective cultural exceptions. As is also the case in the context of the protection of public health, it would be the member state, each member state of the WTO, to determine what they consider for them an appropriate level of protection of cultural diversity. This is a national decision. But once you have set, as a country, once you have set what is an appropriate level of protection of cultural diversity, then any trade restrictive measures that you take can only be taken to the extent that that measure, that trade restrictive measure, is necessary in order to achieve that level of protection of cultural diversity that you've set yourself. And what is necessary? Well, necessary, and there's lots of case law about that in the area of protection of public health, and protection of the environment. Necessary, a measure is necessary when there is no alternative measure that is less trade restrictive and yet meets the objective set. Another condition that would need to be met is that in its application, the trade restrictive measures that would be taken to protect public, to protect cultural diversity in their application, they should not be, or they should not constitute arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination. Again, that is a standard condition that we also now find in the law and the case law on uh, public health protection. In my opinion, and I'm concluding here, in my opinion, the conflict between free trade and cultural diversity is not significantly different from conflicts between free trade and other societal values. And I referred a few times already to public health. And I also referred once to the environment. And there are other societal values I could have referred to. I don't think the conflict is any different. So free trade and cultural diversity, and I'm referring back to the title of my short talk, Free trade and cultural diversity are therefore not an odd couple in a globalized world. But on the contrary, they're a rather normal couple. And conflicts in that couple are best resolved by the introduction in WTO law of effective cultural exceptions similar to, for example, the public health exceptions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, and particularly for uh, emphasizing uh, that there are, uh, there, there are normal couple uh, free trade and cultural diversity because it sounds very paradoxical, protection and cultural diversity um, if you put them next to one another. Um, time allows us for one short comment or question. Is anyone? There is a lady over there. A gentleman over there. Je vais poser ma question en français. C'est pas un problème. C'est aussi la diversité, hein? Mais une question très bref, hein? Euh, je vais essayer, parce que le problème est, vous, vous posez le problème 
je crois que vous posez le problème faussement de la pro du problème de la défense de la culture nationale. Je crois que pour... Euh, je crois que ici, c'est le rôle des intellectuels européens qui n'ont plus d'impact sur les populations européennes. Par exemple, dans les années 70 ou dans les années 60, on avait par exemple Jean-Paul Sartre en France et d'autres intellectuels en Europe, en Italie et d'autres. Mais actuellement, en Europe, on n'a plus cette possibilité de lumière pour suivre certains intellectuels. C'est pour ça que je crois que la culture européenne est devenue infantile. C'est ça son grand problème. Merci. Peter, would you like to react? I think... I think I will um, treat that as a comment and not a question. Um, and a comment that, um, that stands in its own right. So I... Okay, thank you very much. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll use the break time for those who didn't understand the French to give them uh, a uh, kind of late translation of what the actual comment was all about. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ineke Klinge uh, from the Faculty of Health Sciences and uh, who's particularly been involved with uh, research ranging from integration of a diversity perspective in quality insurance in health care institutions to integration of the gender dimension. Ineke, the floor is to you. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. It's my pleasure to take the issue of cultural diversity to the domain of the Faculty of Health Sciences. My presentation will focus on diversity issues in healthcare and more specifically on how healthcare organizations should approach diversity in order to ensure equity in health. Let us first consider existing differences among people. I quote two statements, one from the Dutch geneticist Galliard, who in the 90s said, all people are unequal, referring to the different genetic makeup of individuals. He made this statement to moderate the perceived burden of the technology of prenatal diagnosis, pointing to the fact that we all do have some strange or risky genes. The other quote, is from Article 1 of our Constitution, and I quote freely, all people that live in the Netherlands should be treated on equal terms. Discrimination based upon sex, race, religion, sexual orientation, or otherwise is prohibited. So it follows from these two quotes that all people should be treated the same. However, if we extend this statement to healthcare and would demand that everyone is treated in the same way, then we would end up with serious problems and inadequate healthcare. Let me illustrate this with the example of drug development. For a long time, many drugs were only tested in young white males, easily recruitable from university and not having unruly menstrual cycles. However, Application of these drugs to other groups, like women, children, the elderly, or ethnic minorities, has led to different and sometimes harmful effects. For example, cholesterol-lowering drugs, the statins, were far less effective in women compared to men. As a result, reforms of clinical research have been requested and enforced by law in the United States for research carried out by the National Institutes of Health. Reasons for these reforms lie in the different biology of these groups. Hormonal, metabolic, and genetic differences should be taken into account. We therefore can also proclaim 
that equal treatment in health means, means making a difference. But what kind of differences are we talking about? We have sex, gender, ethnic origin, age, social economic status, sexual orientation, disability, and so on. And all these axes of difference are related to personal and public health and can give rise to large inequalities. Consider, for instance, sex and gender. Sex differences, um, existing differences between men and women are of a biological and a social nature. Sex refers to biological determined differences between men and women. For instance, women are more likely to suffer from autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, but at the same time, they seem to be more resistant against infectious diseases like malaria and tuberculosis. Gender refers to social differences. These are learned and changeable over time and have wide variations both within and between cultures. Women and men play different roles in different social contexts. These roles are valued differently and those associated with men are usually more highly valued. And this affects the degree to which women and men have access to and control over the resources and decision making needed to protect their health. It results in inequitable patterns of health risk, use of health services and health outcomes. Gender roles of women and men affect their personal health. It has been stated in the literature that doing gender is doing health. So sex and gender, the biological and the social, create two groups. But of course, this does not imply homogeneity within each group. Hence, social, economic, cultural, and age differences among women and among men need careful exploration in order to assess their implications for the promotion of gender equality in health. Then we can ask the next question. How should we approach these differences? In terms of determinants or target groups? Theorists of difference have developed a diversity perspective. And by the way, diversity is a much wanted concept nowadays, and it's used in very different ways. In my model, it first of all emphasizes the interaction between axes of difference and hence its dynamic nature. And it also uh, acknowledges factors like biological sex and processes like gender. You see here a picture of the Mikado metaphor, and if there's time, uh, at the end I will try to visualize this uh, metaphor with the uh, Mikado game. Then the relevance of a diversity perspective for organizations in healthcare. One is that such a perspective um, is linked up with today's demand-oriented care. Secondly, that it promotes a situation in which different behaviors, aspirations, and needs of women and men are equally valued and favored. It promotes a situation in which individuals are able to realize their potential for health as the WHO formulates it. And thirdly, it values differences in a positive way and it avoids biological essentialism and stereotyping. So if this is a valuable perspective, then how should we implement this perspective in healthcare and more specifically in healthcare organizations? The approach that I would recommend and in fact adopted in my work would be mainstreaming. Mainstreaming is about changing organizations in such a way that the diversity perspective is built into policies, programs and projects and into ways of seeing and doing. And that is where it addresses culture of an organization. And it's done by those actors that are normally involved. So if you abbreviated it, what should be implemented, where should it be implemented, and by whom, then it is a diversity perspective in policies, programs, and projects by those actors who are normally involved. Mainstreaming diversity follows up upon mainstreaming gender equality. 
And examples of mainstreaming can be found in the research policy of the European Union, the framework programs on biomedical and public health, and in the policy of the WHO. To quote their Madrid statement from 2001, mainstreaming is a strategy that promotes the integration of gender concerns or of a diversity concern for that matter into the formulation, monitoring and analysis of policies, programs and projects with the objective of ensuring that women and men achieve the highest health status. So what makes a mainstream strategy attractive for organizations? Well, that is the multi-level approach. It addresses various levels in an organization, management, culture, and not importantly for healthcare organizations, the primary process. That is the care providing process, the doctor relationship, and so on. What does it promise? It promises ways to overcome health inequalities and it guarantees the delivery of diversity-sensitive health care. And there are organizational benefits. To mention a few, it can save money, it can provide a more diverse input into decision-making, it can raise morale, and it can lead to a more effective delivery of service. And for organizations such as health services, that have direct contact with the diversity of people in the form of patients, it enables a more informed delivery of care. Moreover, some patients may prefer a doctor of their own sex, for instance, for religious reasons. And having a diverse workforce makes it more likely that such requests can be accommodated. It really fits the idea of demand-oriented care. And finally, I would like to present some mainstreaming practices. First, ZonMW, that is the Dutch Organization for Healthcare Research. This organization has launched a five-year theme called OPMAAT, aiming at the organization-wide implementation of diversity and patients' perspective. For the first phase, targeted at the ZonMW staff we developed a masterclass called Prepared for Diversity. Principal component of that program was raising awareness and providing knowledge on the relevance of diversity issues. And secondly, to translate the theory, into, the theory of diversity into practical tools. And that's why we provided a, a little get cut on, for the desk of the staff, which is the Mikado game in a little box with a checklist for checking programs on diversity. So if an organization wants to invest in diversity-sensitive programming, that means, when it comes to research, that in all elements of a research project, so composition of research population, method, data analysis, conclusions, etc., the diversity among patients is taken into account. And this extends to diversity among the research team and other stakeholders in the research project. A second example is from a project on mainstreaming diversity into quality assurance. It is work done in healthcare institutes in the Netherlands. To this end, we, develop, we developed a diversity competence program and offered it to strategic actors in various settings including an institute for mental health, a hospital, and a nursing home. The program is an elaboration of the multi-level approach. It addresses various levels in an organization with implications for financial and personal policy. And finally, an example from my own faculty. I'm happy to say that my research institute has welcomed and formalized the gender and diversity program of which I am the program leader. I myself am currently involved in EU projects on promoting gender equality in biomedical research on food quality and safety. It's expected that those projects will, lead, will yield sex and gender sensitive data that will inform care and public health policies. The EU mainstreaming strategy can be summarized by a simple formula addressing people and content. 
In other words, promoting gender equality means promoting the participation of women and men at all levels in research, and secondly, to ensure that sex and gender issues are taken into account in the research content. And this should be extended to other equality dimensions, such as ethnic origin, age, disability, sexual orientation, and so on. As regards education in my faculty, well, I would say that there is still room for wider implementation of diversity issues in bachelor and master programs. And that takes me to my core message, that mainstreaming diversity will make the difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ineke. Whom would like to um, commend or react shortly? Because then we'll break for musical intermezzo. I think that the uh, there's a gentleman over there. This is a delayed response um, to the last uh, comment. Um, and perhaps delayed because of my advanced age. Uh, the infantile nature of European civilization may in fact date from the period of influence of the luminaries such as Sartre, whom this gentleman just mentioned. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to particularly go into the sex and gender issue? Uh... Sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. It was for you. Yeah, it was for you. Oh, no. No, we, we, we... It was a belated reaction on the, on the second speaker. That's all right, but uh, we do have a problem understanding questions over here. Uh, could you please <laughs> repeat? Perhaps even try another mic. You want to hear this again? Yes, please. For me? Please. Please. Okay, um, what I was doing was simply making a comment on the interjection by the gentleman in this row here uh, after the second speaker when he said that European civilization was infantile and said that we, uh, there was an absence of luminaries like Sartre. And my comment was simply to say that the state of European civilization today was perhaps due to such luminaries like Sartre. I, I would suggest that uh, we would invite uh, Volodymyr Kurilenko who uh, offered to uh, uh, entertain us with the musical intermezzo. Uh. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Volodymyr. This, uh, we, we've heard now three representatives, uh, the first of arts and culture, the second of the field of law, and then uh, Ineke as the third speaker on uh, health sciences. We move on now with uh, experimental health, psychology, governance, and economics and business administration. It's my pleasure to announce Aram Hospas, who uh, has been uh, dealing with the development and evaluation of uh, HIV treatment on the one hand, and uh, is also very much involved, and that's what his uh, presentation will be all about, the uh, gay men and the internet. So very much looking forward to your presentation, Arm. Um, as is, I think, uh, today's experience, uh, after the beautiful music, now for something completely different, um, I would like to discuss a virtual culture, namely that of gay men on the internet. And as I will show in a few moments, the internet has become very popular as a meeting place for these men. But first, I would like to give you some background on my interest in this topic. I'm a member of the group, re research group Reshape, and our research group focuses on HIV prevention. And over the past 15 years, we have contributed to the development of HIV prevention activities for several target groups, such as adolescents, people at risk in developing countries, intravenous drug users, and gay and bisexual men. And examples of interventions are school-based sexual health programs, interventions to promote HIV testing in Tanzania, and risk reduction programs for intravenous drug users in which we motivate them to change needles and use clean needles. Health psychologists see developing intervention as a very systematic and planned activity. And as you can see on this slide, when we address a health problem, we first look for risk behaviors that are related to a particular health problem. Next, we investigate the determinants of these behaviors, which could, for example, be knowledge or attitudes or skills. And we then develop interventions to try to influence these determinants. And an evaluation at the end assesses whether or not we were successful in changing the determinants, changing the behaviors, and usually in the very long run, were successful in diminishing health problems. Let me give you an example. Among adolescents, the risk behavior associated with HIV and other sexually transmitted infections is unprotected sex. And research shows that the lack, that lack of negotiation skills is an important determinant of unprotected sex. For example, skills to introduce condoms or skills to refuse having sex. And an intervention which we developed and is now being used in most high schools in the Netherlands is a program delivered by teachers in which a training program to improve negotiation skills is a very important part. And the evaluation has shown that significant changes in determinant and risk behavior were achieved in a quasi-experimental study. So, in order to develop effective interventions, we need input from epidemiologists and we conduct research on risk behaviors and, risk and behavioral determinants ourselves. Now, I'm now getting a little bit closer to today's, today's topic, because in order to build interventions, we also conducted many behavioral surveys among gay and bisexual men, including two nationwide studies in 2000 and 2003. And in these two studies, the so-called monitor studies, questionnaires were handed out by volunteers on meeting places for gay and bisexual men. In both studies, over 2,000 questionnaires were handed out, and we received approximately 1,250 questionnaires back in each wave. And it struck us that from 2000 to 2003, there was a very large increase in the percentage of men who had access to the internet, from 37% to 79%. But more importantly, there was also a very large increase from 17% to 46% in the use of internet for chatting and dating. And dating not only meant having tea, but usually having sex as well. In order to get more insight in the role of the internet, we launched an, launched an online questionnaire study. And we were very fortunate that the owners of the major chat site for gay and bisexual men in the Netherlands were very cooperative 
and gave us access to their site to re recruit respondents. And actually, in the beginning, we called them in Haarlem, where they had a little house, and now I have to call to Marbella, where they have moved their business and live in a very beautiful villa overlooking the ocean. The online questionnaire included demographics and questions on chatting, dating, and risk behaviors. And in 28 days, we registered approximately 12,000 visits to our study homepage. 8,050 men started with the questionnaire, and over 5,000 actually submitted a completed questionnaire. And on the map of the Netherlands, each dot represents a respondent, and this map is very similar to the population density map of the Netherlands. So it happens everywhere in the Netherlands. And one of the most important findings, and that's actually why I wanted to show you this, in, in, because it, I think it's relevant for today's topic, was the very different demographic makeup from this online study when we compared it to our paper and pencil studies. Firstly, we found that there were substantially more younger gay and bisexual men in the online sample compared to offline samples. And second, whereas the monitor survey, the paper and pencil one, only attracted 8% respondents from a non-Dutch or mixed cultural background, the online sample had 19%. And finally, one in five respondents in the online sample said to be bisexual, compared to only 5% in our offline uh, sample. And it's very interesting that many Dutch HIV policy documents in the past 15 years have systematically recommended to put more efforts into targeting exactly these groups, younger men, non-Dutch men, and bisexual men. And up to now, it proved very difficult to reach these target groups, but with the internet we may have found a new channel for delivering interventions to these target groups. Now, the internet and the technology that comes with it gives the pre prevention field the opportunity to deliver very focused and interactive interventions. However, since this is a very new field, it also, we ha also still have to learn a lot about what works and what doesn't work on the internet. And just to give you one very example about how, the, how different the internet can be, is that people present themselves sometimes very differently from who they really are. In, in one of our studies, a respondent at the end, could, when they could leave comments, said, well, I actually ha uh, I like your research so much and I don't want to mess it up and I have a confession to make. I said in the beginning I was 23, but I'm actually 63. Could you please change that? Anyway, so we are now trying to develop interventions for the internet and we've recently finished our first online intervention for gay and bisexual men on the internet. It was called Gay Cruise, and which was an animated and interactive online intervention to promote safer sex. Participants could choose their own person who would then take them around the ship. <laughs> and on that trip they participated in several activities. For example, they were contestant in a quiz that tested knowledge on HIV, and they went to the ship's movie theater to see a movie in which virtual role models discussed safe sex during, during sexual encounters. In three weeks, over 5,000 men boarded our virtual ship, were randomly assigned to a control and experimental condition, and the evaluation showed that the men who were exposed to the intervention significantly improved on behavioral determinants and safer sex behavior. To summarize, many gay men have moved to the internet and part of the gay culture is, is now a virtual one. And this required the prevention field to move to the internet as well. And which gave new possibilities such as interactive online interventions and at the same time poses new challenges since a lot has to be learned about prevention in the virtual world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harm, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, whom would like to uh, comment or react? Uh, I know it sometimes feels like a touchy subject, but, but you've all seen that uh, most of us like it if you present it well. <laughs> okay, 
No one interested in commenting? Um, it, you surely scored a good point there because they're all flabbergasted uh, by what you presented. Uh, we'll move on and I'll invite uh, Anne-Marie uh, Rima, who uh, will uh, talk about governance in particular, which is a new initiative of Universiteit Maastricht, the School of Governance. Uh, I'm um, happy to introduce Anne-Marie because she's been very much involved also with research in Rotterdam, uh, which is uh, her and my home place and, and some of the guests who are also from Rotterdam. She's been working for the Tinbergen Institute, uh, which is always a pleasure to uh, mention. And uh, she's at the moment the Associate Academic Director of the Maastricht uh, Graduate School of Governance. Um, and she'll talk about the cultural interpretation of good governance. Uh, Anne-Marie, floor is to you. Ladies and gentlemen, before I start my presentation, I would like to thank the Faculty of Economics and Business Administration for giving me the opportunity to give a presentation on the state of the cultural diversity in relation to governance. And of course, I would like to congratulate the Dean of the Faculty, Professor Lemming, Professor Hofstede, Professor Peterson, and all other members of the faculty with this new Geert Hofstede Chair in Cultural Diversity. And of course, I want to compliment the whole faculty with the excellent symposium they organized today. In this presentation, I would like to discuss with you the question whether cultural interpretations of good governance actually exist. Before turning into this relationship, I would, I would like to define the concept of culture and good governance. By the way, the findings of this presentation are based on a research which the Maastricht Graduate School of Governance is doing jointly with the OECD in Paris. And it's also based on various articles of the United Nations Expert Group on Co Managing Diversity in Civil Services. This, this is an uh, expert group of the United Nations and they clearly embraced also the work of Professor Geert Hofstede. In the last decades, the concept of governance has emerged as a new paradigm which implies much more than the traditional concept of government. The term governance denotes a system of values, policies, institutions by which a society manages its economic, political, and social affairs through interaction between the state, civil society, and the private sector. Viewed in this context, the, context, the term governance involves all government's active, government activities that guide, steer, control, or manage society. In essence, governance includes a range of activities involving all cultural communities and stakeholders in the country. All government institutions, political parties, interest groups, non-governmental organizations, the private sector, and la last but not least, the public at large. Having defined governance, then good governance, is the extent to which these activities are executed in an efficient, effective, transparent, and accountable way. More interesting is, however, how the question how we can measure good governance, and I will come to this in a minute. The next element in this discussion is culture. What is culture? I will define culture as a system of values, beliefs, transitions, and practices which structure and regulates the behavior of individuals as well as groups. A culture is generally embodied in its art, in its art, music, oral and written literature, communication, etc. As defined as, as such, it is not uncommon to see different societies interpreting their vision of a good life, moral values and customs in their respective cultures differently. And therefore, therefore, we can expect that different cultures, cultures will interpret good governance differently. 
Now coming back to the good governance and how we can measure that. Good governance has become vitally important in developing countries in recent years, both for the attraction of international investors and for the providers of official development aid. For investors, the quality of governance has become the single most important determinant of their investment location decision, both in developing and emerging market economies. In 1966, the World Bank reversed its long-standing policy of largely ignoring problems of corruption and bad confidence in borrowing countries. Since then, donors increasingly use good governance indicators to identify and reward developing countries that improve the quality of their governance. This growth of interest in the quality of governance has driven an equally explosive growth in the use of governance indicators in developing countries. Four sets of phenomena has driven this explosive growth. They are a spectacular growth of international investment, the end of the Gold War, a worldwide notion that strong markets require good governance, and the understanding of the strong relation between governance and economic growth. The most common used governance indicators are the ones developed by the World Bank. The World Bank indicators are compositions of many aspects of governance, including government effectiveness, control of corruption, financial risk, gender equity, and social protection. The aggregate indicators of the World Bank are a mix of objective, fact-based components and of subjective, perception-based components. And they are determined by hundreds of different existing indicators, compiled from 37 different data sources supplied by 31 different organizations. And this complexity makes it difficult to compare governance indicators over countries and over time. For instance, if you look at China and India, they have similar scores on the governance indicator. But China scores in the upper half of all countries on government effectiveness and in the lower quarter of all countries on voice and accountability. Whereas India scores in the middle of all countries on both these components in the, governments, in the governance indicator. The subjective perception-based components of the World Bank indicators use a variety of sources, such as population studies, enterprise surveys, and expert assessments. However, in the aggregate indicator, hardly any importance is assigned to population surveys. And thus, the opinion of the population on governance components carry practically no weight in the aggregate indicators. Recent surveys carried out in Africa showed that the assessment of the quality of local governance given by experts differs substantially from those given by people from the local population. For instance, experts and local households were asked the same questions on the perception of corruption in Africa. While the experts expected an, on average that 32% of the local population would believe bribery to be an acceptable practice, only 5% of the local population actually reported, reported holding this belief. And while the expert believed that 55% of the population would say it had experienced acts of corruption in the last year, only 13% of the population reported it had. Furthermore, most of the weight in the indicated indicators is given to enterprise surveys and the expert assessments. And they are predominantly reported by the male and economically well-off. Effectively, this means that governance indicators ignore the experience and perspective of most women and of the poor. 
This also implies that the interest of unofficial businesses, which employ the majority of the population in poor countries, are completely ignored. So, from the above, we can conclude that the World Bank indicators are Western and private sector biased and do not take into account cultural differences within countries and therefore do not give a fair representation of the level of good governance. So, one can state that it is most likely that there are different cultural interpretations of good governance, but since cultural diversity is not taken into account in the indicators, we cannot in identify these differences with the help of these indicators. What can we do to improve this situation? The following recommendations are given to move forward. Firstly, Use more fact-based information, including inform information of informal institutions. Secondly, include local population studies and the local ideas on the quality of local governance, including the perspective of non-business interests. Thirdly, use less composite indicators. By using simple indicators, a more diverse a more representative image of the governance features will be given. Fourthly, there should be more transparency. The World Bank should strive for transparent and publicly available sets of governance indicators based on facts and on the perception of a diversity of population groups. And fifth, governance have a role to play in preserving and promoting cultural diversity. And therefore, cultural diversity protection should be incorporated in the indicators as an essential element of good governance. When the World Bank will adopt these recommendations and will create new governance indicators which do take in account the, imp the improvements mentioned not only external stakeholders, such as the investors and donors, can use these indicators, but also the internal stakeholders, such as the local government itself and the NGOs, can use these indicators in an effective way to bring about actually improvements in the quality of governance in their country. We can clearly see that the world of the 21st century is a world of cultural diversity instead of a world of cultural homogeneity and dominance. The presence of cultural diversity in governance, both national and subnational administrations, multinational corporations, and international organizations is vital. And thus, cultural diversity should be incorporated in the indicators of good governance. And I believe that the World Bank is the organization who should give the right example. The time has come for the world of the 21st century to learn to live with, accept and benefit and celebrate his own diversity. And with this new Geert Hofstede chair, we can start here in Maastricht with this celebration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Uh, it's, uh, it's noticeable that uh, if, if Jo Ritson would be here with his World Bank history, he would certainly uh, be the first one to, uh, to react. It's, on the other hand, also interesting to see that very recently uh, there was a very nice dissertation defended here at the Universiteit Maastricht between governance effectiveness indicators of the World Bank on the one hand and nutrition and malnutrition programs uh, on the other. So there is a growing awareness at the World Bank that they should change and become culturally um, aware. Whom else would like to uh, comment or react on uh, some of the very intriguing statements? Uh, 
There you go, sir. Let me see whether we can detect the microphone that's being brought. Thank you very much. Excuse me that I am asking a question. <laughs> But I would like to share with you an experience from my innovation classes um, in, the, in Eindhoven, where I yeah, used to teach, among other places. And that had to deal with bribery. And I used to have a lot of Swedish students in there. And as you know, the world index of bribery <laughs> shows those Scandinavian countries uh, below very low standards, you know, uh, as being the best ethical, from the Western standpoint, uh, countries to deal with. But on the other hand, there is another uh, ranking, and uh, which countries are dealing the most with bribery or just go with it? And my Swedish students could not believe me, because <laughs> Sweden was there almost on the top. So there seems to be a little bit a contradiction. And I would relate that to your figures you had. I did not follow it very clearly, but you made a distinction between experts, the opinion of experts, and the opinion of uh, the public about how serious the bribery would be. Uh, do I, uh, excuse me, I'm just looking at the wrong person, excuse me. Uh, um, yes, excuse me for this. Um, well, how, how would you rhyme this? I mean, how could you deal would there be a practical conclusion from uh, what you propose as a new rule of conduct when it comes to dealing with cultural diversity? Could you, uh, could you draw a practical conclusion and relate that to my difficulty with my Swedish students in my Eindhoven class? Thank you. Thank you, Annemarie. Um, but what you can f clearly see is that um, uh, the experts were asked how they would think the population, the local population, would answer the questions. And then apparently they think that uh, the local population in Africa accepts bribery. But um, if you ask the local population themselves, it's clear that they, they are not accepting bribery. And only 5% of the people, which is, of course, very little, um, are really accepting this, this bribery. So it's very strange that um, in the indicators that population, the answer of the population is not weighted at all or hardly weighted, while the, 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 uh, the answers of the experts do get a lot of attention and do get a lot of weight within the indicators. So in a, you are measuring in the, the wrong uh, things within the good governance indicators because people do not accept bribery, although the exp experts, which are most Western male <laughs> persons, they think that African people do accept bribery. The gentleman reacts asking whether then the practical conclusion would be that bribery would be accepted. Yeah, and I think the, what is clear that the people in Africa accept, uh, think the same about bribery as, as we do here in, in, in Europe. But the experts think they, do, they think differently about bribery, which is not the case, which comes clear from these pictures. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Uh, there's a Lady over there would like to have the floor and the uh, microphone. Could you, one way or the other, hand it over? Hello. Um, I do have some difficulties with English, I suppose. I'm trying. I'm going to try. Uh, I hear about your rec uh, recommendations. And uh, the first thing I would like to say is that uh, what I missed in your... Um, in your total um, presentation, that I, I would have uh, loved to have more um, 
visualization of what you said, because you did say a lot of interesting things, but you were saying them, and we were looking at one page. That was just the remark that I wanted, wanted to uh, make first. Uh, but what I did get was that you did make a lot of uh, recommendations, uh, which were very um, uh, global, very, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, well, not very specific, very general. When I uh, try to compare with uh, what, um, what I did read about um, Geert Hofstede, was that he took uh, uh, IBM, as, as one company and then took, uh, took uh, say, this specific company and tried to compare within companies. And now what we are talking, what you're talking about is trying to compare countries. And this seems to me so awful, awful difficult to, uh, to, to um, well, where do you start um, compromise? Uh, uh, now, compriming, where do you start making a selection? And my question is, do you know where initiatives are being taken now to, um, in which direction do, uh, are initiatives taken um, to the World Bank? Who is doing what? Is this the Geert Hofstede chair that is going to, that we're going to hope for? Or uh, are there, are they, um, um, are there good in initiatives taken already? Because this is so complex, the thing you're, you've been talking about, and the recommendations are still so wide that I think, oh, this is a great big job for years and years for lots, lots of uh, people to do research on. Okay, thank you very much. Anne-Marie, could you show the... Yeah, I, I hope that uh, this uh, question would be uh, raised uh, today because, of course, I hope that uh, the School of Governance can work together with uh, Professor Peterson and, and do research uh, in this uh, field. Um, but uh, we haven't discussed, uh, as I said, this, uh, these um, um, recommendations are outcomes of a, a study uh, we have conducted together with the OECD. And we haven't discussed these outcomes to, yet with the, the World Bank. Um, so um, I think within a couple of months, we, we will discuss this, this with the World Bank. And then we can see it, it, how they can adjust or if they want to adjust their, their indicators. And I agree with you that it, this is a very complex uh, matter. But uh, as you, when you look at the the, the governance indicators now, they are very, very complex. As I said, they're really uh, one uh, indicator is, is uh, aggregate of, of hundreds of, of different things they, they measure and they got from very uh, large uh, different uh, data sources. So I think that it, it is not a, a matter of making it more complex. I think it's more a matter of making it more simple. But on the other hand, taking into account much more um, yeah, cultural diversity and much more uh, things that the, the local population uh, finds important and that can really contribute to, to improvements uh, of uh, good governance in countries. Sorry, one more question. Is it, is it, uh, is it only you or your school uh, with the OECD uh, being active on this, I, I can't imagine that it's it's only us here doing this thing, it, which seems of quite Im some importance, actually. Well, I, I haven't come across uh, our research uh, in this field, but um, I hope that there will be others working uh, in this matter, and I also hope that that the World Bank will take notice of of this kind of research and really uh, will, will change their, their indicators. But I haven't, I haven't uh, learned about uh, positive experiences somewhere. I haven't, but maybe we'll have to do some more research in this field. Thanks.
Okay, I'll, I'll make sure that, uh, Annemarie, that, that if you don't yet have a copy of the dissertation that I was referring to, I'll give you copies, uh, because it entails uh, references to uh, recent research in this area. And we'll see later on with the inaugural address of Professor Peterson whether he sees any window uh, for research in this area, but that's all up to him, uh, and, and, and this is still uh, not known um, for us. It's a pleasure to... Um, introduce Dr. Art van Ettersen uh, as the last speaker, not in the least because uh, Art van Ettersen, next to being an academician, is also a novelist and a typical, you might say, local observer uh, of Maastricht, uh, writing a column on a weekly basis in uh, the leading newspaper, the Limburger, for those who are familiar with this region. So I wouldn't be surprised if storytelling would be part of his presentation. Uh, Art, the floor is to you. Well, thank you, Will, for these nice words. Uh, Professor Lemming, Professor Peterson, um, Professor Hofstede, ladies and gentlemen, but above all, dear Geert, dear Maike, I'm happy to be here. Since I represent the faculty where Geert Hofstede has worked for many years, uh, I take the liberty to start with some personal notes and then uh, quickly move on to more serious stuff. Um, Whenever I am at a conference abroad and I see that uh, the welcome cocktail party is sort of dying out slowly, uh, I have this trick in, in my sack and I move up to, I step up to not some cozy looking scholars, mostly Scandinavians, Irish, and I, said, and I say, hey, did you know I am a former PhD student of Geert Hofstede? <laughs> Success guaranteed. They said, what? Hofstede? Do you mean Hofstede? I said, yes, Hofstede. And then we embark upon a nice spree in whatever town we are. Geert is back. Geert is back today uh, in person and tomorrow as an institution because the faculty uh, host this new chair. Um, as I said, I have witnessed many of Geert's uh, lectures in the late uh, 80s, early 90s at our faculty, and some of the, 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 the most daring students uh, stood up and said, uh, you are presenting data which were collected in the late 1970s. Then I was only a baby. Uh, in other words, how, how is that possible? The world is changing so rapidly. And then uh, Geert came always with his, his big trick is say, well, these differences date back ages and ages and ages. And uh, one of the things, uh, I show you a very dramatic map uh, indicating in nice bright colors those countries which were once part of the Roman Empire and in lack of colors you see those barbaric regions where the German tribes ruled supreme. And the border between that colored and uncolored world roughly runs through the city of Maastricht. <laughs> Perhaps even my backyard. <laughs> one of the things, one of the findings of Geert Hofstede, which were very interesting in, in Western Europe, was this particular sort of cleavage between those countries who score high on power distance and low, and those countries that score high on uncertainty avoidance and low. And roughly, they coincide with these boundaries. So there may be an effect of the Catholic Church, surely, uh, in the sense that centralization of power and the avoidance of uncertainty through rules uh, was endorsed by the Catholic Church, but it all started during the Roman Empire. Um, okay, I take a leap now, because now we're back uh, in the days of that Jesus w walked around. Now I take a leap forward some 800 years, and um, as you all know, or should know, Geert Hofstede was the founding father of internationalization at our, if not university, then faculty. He established uh, the International Management Program, and that started off in the Aachen, Liege, Maastricht area. So our first partners were the universities of Aachen 
and Liège. And that area, comprising three countries, three languages, no, four, we have Maastricht language as well, four languages, um, was once an empire, you could say. Nowadays it is called the U region, it's a sort of a laboratory of European collaboration, but it once was the, uh, an, an empire headed by a mister who was called Karl der Große in Aachen, where he, where he lived most of the, and is buried, and who is called Charlemagne in the city of Liège. Now, I don't know many kings or emperors who have statues in different countries, and certainly not in different cultures like the, the Latin and Germanic culture which runs through Europe. By the way, he also had a, um, a penthouse, you could say, or pied à terre in Maastricht, and that was on this very spot. It has been found that Charlemagne also lived here some days a year. Okay, here you see in green the empire at its height of its power. Almost, some people say it was a second Roman empire, but then that should have a cultural effect as well, and it hasn't. Perhaps for this reason, shortly after uh, Charlemagne's death, his son, and further on his three of his grandsons, as things go in good families, uh, split up the empire in three parts. And that was sort of the beginning of all misery, you could argue. Green became later Republic of France. The, uh, what is it, orange became Germany, and there was the kingdom of Lorraine, right? Right in the middle, between those two uh, bl bl uh, uh, clusters, as it were. And these comprised the, the low countries, Lorraine, uh, Burgundy, uh, present-day Franche-Comté, Provence, northern Italy. And, uh, but now I'm, I'm probably romanticizing a lot, but I, I hold it possible that this region has produced people me being one of them, that are quite sensitive to cultural differences. Precisely because they are born and grew up on the fringe, on the border, on the intersection between the Germanic and Latin world. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so this is the, the, the first part of my, of my, uh, my speech is a statement, which, we, which may lead to discussion, a statement that those people in the central realm between the rivers Rhein and Rhone are what some anthropologists call have a betwixt and between character. And this was uh, already uh, also in the re reactions to the first speaker, this came up. Isn't it good to be part of two, country, two cultures or of, of non-culture, and then this bipolarity, as it was called, is something that interests me a lot. Uh, I use the image of a bat here, and being born in the, in the suburb of St. Peter here in Maastricht, I have seen many of these bats in the local caves in St. Petersburg, what people left of it. And bats, too, you could say, are betwixt and between. I mean, we, we all know, we are learned people, that they are mammals, but they can fly. So they also have some elements of, of birds. Uh, they fly, they are most active in twilight, between day and night. So in all respects, they are betwixt and between. They are hated, feared, but at the same time they are admired. And if you make soup of their wings, your love life will never be the same. I didn't try it yet, but... <laughs> so in other words, people living in cultural frontier regions, in border regions, might profit from the fact that they are part of both cultures, 
a part of neither culture, and that they may have perhaps their own hybrid type of culture. Okay. Now, now I move quickly on to the more, somewhat more serious uh, uh, observations. What happened to, uh, you could say, Hirt's orphans when he left the faculty? Some of them, uh, like me, PhD students, and uh, René Oli, and I, I thought I saw John Spangenberg as well. And some of us, um, well, continued working, obviously, with national and corporate cultural differences. And on the other hand, within our department, and I focus now on the Department of Organization and Strategy, um, we're working on team, top management team research. Christoph Bohn, Ayer van Witteloestuin, uh, Woody van Olfen, amongst others. And what happened, I think, is that, well, the angle of the line does not show any uh, hierarchical order, I, I hope, but somehow some of us joined the research on who are, the top management, who are the, our top managers, who are the people who are in power of our most powerful organizations. And we, we joined them uh, by adding a specific cultural angle to it. We're still working on that. And hopefully that can continue together with Professor Peterson. Now, within top management team studies, which is a very flourishing uh, research tradition, uh, started also in the 1980s. Traditionally, the emphasis has been on what is called demographic antecedents. In other words, if you enter, if you look at executive boards, at top management teams, uh, there has been a growing interest in what will be the effects of the fact that most of them are men, some women. Most of them are middle-aged, some young. Uh, some of them have worked there for 20 years, others flew in the day before, etc., etc. So all kinds of, of variables, of demographic variables like gender, age, tenure, also personality, have been studied to the extent what will be the outcomes, what will be the firm's strategy if a top management team is composed such or such? What will be the, the profit rate, etc., etc.? Now, increasingly so, in our field, we are opening up the black box of what you could call grey-suited man. Not the type of man you find on the, on the gay cruise, but <laughs> the man you can see here, with nice suits on, <laughs> executive managers. What are they doing in their boardrooms? How do they interact? <laughs> well, now, don't let your imagination run away with you, please. They are talking serious business. But how do they influence each other? How do they communicate? How are the power struggles? Now, these things currently at our department are being more and more studied. We look at processes within top management team. Now, and here is where we come in. Here, here is where Geert Hofstede's legacy comes in. That some of us, like Ursula Glunk, Marielle Heiltjes, um, René Oli and I, are trying to, to add something to, to that perspective. We try to look at mostly national cultural codes, scripts, norms, if you wish, rules of the game, uh, plus the less, the less liquid, you could say, elements of institutional frameworks and arrangements, such as the corporate governance system in a country, one-tier, two-tier boards, for instance, the financial system, who gives you money, the educational system, who creates managers to be, and we try to, to present these as alternative antecedents for top management team structures and behaviors. And surely, uh, in, at the marketing department or the accounting department, uh, Geert Hofstede's work is, is used as well. And, but I focus now on this particular uh, substream within our department. 
Here are some of the publications. Quickly move on. <laughs> in summary, we have looked in the past years to the, to the effects of cultural differences, a la Hofstede, a la the five dimensions, and of institutions, as I mentioned, on the composition of top management. That's what the normal TMT studies also do, looking at composition. At the discretion, how much power do managers have given the culture they grew up in, given the institutions with which they have to reckon. And also at selection, promotion, career patterns, and also how they, again, leave the building. Those things are too culturally and institutionally uh, influenced. Now, to, sh to, uh, to finish off this thing, I want to show you uh, three elements of a paper which uh, René Oli and I uh, have finished by now, and which you can find in the last bullet, but I'll show you the next slide, which it summarizes, and those will be my final remarks. Um, if you look at the right column, there you see some elements of top management teams which have been rarely studied as far as now. Seldomly people ask themselves, who, what are these top management teams? Can you draw a circle around them, for instance? Or are they rather a loose uh, constellation of people flying in and flying out, like a sand dune? Now, corporate governance has an effect on that. In, in my country and in Germany, for instance, there is a strict separation between the executives and the supervisory people. That it allows for the, those executives to feel more like a team because they're working daily on the same issues. If in a collectivistic country, come back to culture again, in collectivistic countries, team boundaries are also more strictly drawn. People feel more part of a team. The same goes with membership interdependence. Again, it depends on corporate governance, on cultural differences, whether members of a team have a lot of interaction, whether they do things together. Sometimes it's prescribed by law or good governance that all members should work together on tasks. In other countries, perhaps the US, that is much less the case. And also, obviously, leadership centrality, so how much power does the CIO has, differs from country to country, from corporate governance system to corporate governance system, and also from high to low power distance countries. So, wrapping up, the very popular notion of teams and I focused on top management teams, but you can also focus on lower echelon teams. The very popular notion of teams as a laboratory of cultural cooperation, cultural clashes. We first have to ask our questions, are we dealing with teams, with real teams at the top of an organization? Or are they just loose groups of individuals? Or are they a single emperor like Charlemagne with some hangers on? Those questions cannot be answered without reference to the institutional context and even more so, perhaps, the national cultural context. Many wise things have been said here this afternoon about shifting identities and uh, multiple backgrounds, and st but still, a national culture is something as a thing in its own, to quote Durkheim again. It still exists. And perhaps more than we would like to, uh, but it is, it is an effect and we should study it uh, in organizations. I'll stop here. And uh, I'll take questions in any modern language, but I will answer them. If you do that, I will answer them in Maastricht. Thank you very much.
Well, you're all challenged now to uh, look into your language proficiency and, and see whether you can challenge art in uh, responding in uh, mistakes. The gentleman over there. Uh, I would like to say one thing. I've been here like since the beginning of the presentations, and if I could say that if there's one, if this is the view of diversity from the University of Maastricht, then one could say that it's um, very clinical, and in a sense, as the Germans say, weltfremd. Um, mm -hmm. Thing is that uh, uh, Dutch society has been marked by a lot of uh, social events. We've seen the downfall of, of, of the multicultural dream. Uh, we've seen a lot of things happening, and that has, has had a great impact on Dutch society. And if I come here and the UM discusses diversity, then it's about uh, um, uh, gay people on the internet, it's about uh, 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 team leadership, it's about uh, policy of uh, the World Bank and the WTO. Um, so, am I right, uh, or is it is my criticism? Is that is there any ground for my criticism, or is it really true that uh, the view of the UM on diversity is really very clinical, and uh, there's not been one look in the mirror about how is stuff going on here in Maastricht, for example? How is diversity being implemented here? And what is the role of, um, of your leadership, actually, your uh, knowledge in bringing about diversity even here in the Netherlands? I guess, I guess that quite a few of us are tempted to react, but we'll leave it up to us. Well, I, I take the point that of this clinical, clinical look, um, but Surely, I mean, in, in order to detect any disease, you have to first look clinically and then start nurturing the, the patient, if, if any. Um, certainly, uh, um, my personal view is that large quantitative studies in, in detecting uh, quantitative differences in cultures makes a very clinical impression on people. And it, it's, to me, it's the first, it's the first step uh, in order to fully understand the, the richness of diversity and the, the complexities, one has to, to step forward and undertake case studies or go into to meet people and, and to be there and to have a less clinical but more sort of uh, a humane uh, approach. But that does not say, I think, that we should leave the responsibility of looking at things from a detached way uh, that we should leave that alone. I think we need bo both approaches. Uh, I don't know whether it's our, the res how far our responsibility stretches to improve uh, the diversity climate in a city like Maastricht. Uh, that is a very tough que question which I cannot easily answer, whether that's a responsibility to work on that as well. We should also be very much aware that the, this part one was the state of disciplines, meaning that this was only a selection of some of the typical approaches uh, which you find here at uh, UM. But if you would look at the overall structure of UM, it's a very nice representation of a modern university uh, which is in debate with new developments. Uh, if you would look at the schools and faculties and at the applied research institutions, so there, there's much more, more to show, but uh, we had to be selective and uh, focused on the disciplines. Uh, Who else would like to uh, react? The gentleman over there in the middle, could the microphone one way or the other be? <coughs> the shortest route would have been right from the central middle. Voorzitter, ik heb begrepen dat ik ook in Nederlands mag spreken en toen dacht ik dat is mijn kans. Want uh, als ik het in een andere taal moet doen, dan kan ik me niet zo goed uitdrukken. Ik had een vraag. Ik ben zeer onder de indruk van alle aspecten die hier zijn toegelicht vanmiddag. Maar is nou mijn conclusie juist dat ik gemist heb de eigen verantwoordelijkheid van mensen? Want bij alles wat ik heb gehoord, wordt er verwezen naar alles en nog wat, naar de hele wereld. 
Maar steeds weer hoor ik ook, er zijn uitzonderingen. En wat willen we nu in onze samenleving? We willen altijd regeltjes hebben, want dan kunnen we ons achter verschuilen. En dat lijkt mij heel slecht, want uiteindelijk zijn we allemaal verantwoordelijk voor wat, wat we zelf doen. Bent u dat met me eens of heb ik dat verkeerd begrepen? Uh, just for the uh, non-native uh, audience, uh, the, the focus of the question or comment is on uh, uh, that, that the presentations lacked uh, attention for own responsibility and that uh, we were particularly looking into exemptions. Maybe Ot would like to uh, react on this shortly. And you could yeah. do this, you should do this actually in the local dialect because you said if, an <laughs> if anyone would ask a question uh, not in English then you would react in the local dialect which would then again uh, load me up with uh, a translation of this to the non-natives. Uh. Perhaps better not, then we will end up with the uh, East Maastricht, uh, West Maastricht uh, <laughs> divide. <laughs> and it is worse enough as it is. Um, exceptions, uh, clearly, uh, um, the common denominator here is we are talking about cultures, and cultures are group things. And it, it, I can t you should envisage an infer inverted U shape, and a cultural score is the, is the average. And there are many people on the extremes, and so these are the, ex in, the in that sense, everybody is almost an exception. You have bigger and smaller exceptions. But we should never make the mistake to, uh, to uh, see people as representatives of their cultures only. So that would be a very, very the danger of stereotyping then becomes very, very big. I mean, I am Dutch, but only partly so. I, am also, I also have a certain personality. And, and so the exceptions should uh, deserve, deserve all our attention and nourishment. Okay, we could take one last short question or comment. Uh, Professor Roux over there. Yes, I would like to get back to this question about where is the diversity of the Netherlands in this uh, symposium. Um, I think that that's a real critical point and it's good to address it. The, um, there are two points of view at least. One is uh, from an outsider point of view, an observer point of view, we can look at what diversity is. And then we typically look at how many people of what sort are present. That's the diversity in the team studies. That's much of the diversity of the kind we have discussed today. How many different people are there? How many of this? How many of that? How many? What countries do they come from? What languages do they speak, etc.? That is one way to look at diversity. There's another way to look at diversity, which is more from the experience, from the inside point of view. And I think both the first speaker and the last one have addressed that each of us is not just holder of one culture. We are Dutch, we're European, we're Amsterdammer, we're in favor of Ajax, we are whatever. We can be, we can have multiple identities and be part of multiple cultures and carry multiple cultures at the same time. That's another way to approach it. But once we open this perspective, we also are faced with the question, how do we deal as holders of these multiple identities and carriers of multiple cultures, but the other people around us who also try to do this, and the lady from Canada uh, pointed it out very clearly, we all try to do this and communicate with other people coming from inside, and we have sometimes success, but we have also great difficulties. There are really lots of problems in dealing with people from cultures that are farther away, and we are bothered by some of the rules and the principles of our own national culture in the Netherlands, which is really making this concept difficult. And I don't want to, to stir up the discussion against about how the Germans think in terms of culture and who belongs to it and who doesn't belong to it. Um, we're doing very much the same in this country. And this is a hot itch issue. And it is brought to our attention every day again. We have a special minister to do this. And we have really to consider what it means for the way we deal with each other. That was a comment. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, my suggestion is that, that we break because th this issue will come up anyway at the forum, uh, which will uh, at, in part two, uh, but that's a forum that, that goes just after 
first and foremost, uh, the introduction of Geert Hofstede and the inaugural address by Mark Peterson. We then have a forum on issues which will certainly also touch on this issue. Uh, um, I would like to uh, conclude this part one, the state of the disciplines, by uh, also assuring you that backstage that we will materially uh, thank the presenters uh, with flowers and books and all kinds of things that will <laughs> hopefully enrich them um, and, and give them a good feeling. You didn't do this here, but backstage is the best opportunity to do so. Front stage, we could thank them very much by giving them a large applause. Thank you very much.